Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. All right, well, the biggest headline, of course, uh, out of the WWDC was Tim, T- Tim Cook talking about artificial intelligence. Recent developments in generative intelligence and large language models offer powerful capabilities that provide the opportunity to take the experience of using Apple products to new heights. Introducing Apple Intelligence, the new personal intelligence system that makes your most personal products even more useful and delightful. Here in the studio with more is Sam Palmasano. He's former CEO of IBM. He is also currently the board chair of America's Frontier Fund, a nonprofit developed to support critical tech to ensure U.S. competitiveness. Sam, it's so great to get you on set. You're our first guest on set for the new show. I'm honored. Thank you so much. We're going to get you a hat or a T-shirt. I need something. Okay, perfect. We're going to make my hair a little darker. We're going to (laughs) wear. Someone can. (laughs) Um, Okay, (laughs) so let's take a broader view then when it comes to AI. How does the U.S. take the appropriate amount of risk? to make sure that it can stay ahead? Oh, that's a great question, quite honestly. And I'll step back and say, look at the models today and why we created the American Frontier Fund. The models today are heavily oriented around software. You heard that mm-hmm. today with the Apple announcements. To stay ahead in tech, it has to be much more than just software. So you need long-term investments in science and research. U.S. is far ahead in science and research, but we're losing track on commercialization that builds the new technologies, that changes the future, not just consumer convenience. I mean, how healthcare is done, mm-hmm. how banking or financial systems are run, how the national security and national defense occurs, all those types of things require much longer cycles of investment, and that's why we created this thing called the American Frontier Fund. We want to keep the West ahead of the East. So we have the CHIPS Act, right? Yes. We clearly have big tech innovating like crazy. Where are we falling short? Like, where do you think the money and the talent and the time needs to go into? Well, that's a great question, because obviously the you issue... You keep telling me that. Well, okay, then I'll tell you it's a bad... <laughs> well, that's an okay question. I'll ask Roman for a good question. No, but seriously, what it is that the point that the cycles that we're talking about for these very advanced applications require, I'll say, let's say 10 to 15 years. We call it the valley of death. To take it from science and research through the valley of death to get it to commercialization takes a long time. So to do that, you have to create a uh, partnerships or an ecosystem with the research laboratories, with the academic institutions, with the private sector as well. And you need government involved because of the risk associated of getting through the valley of death. And that's what we are about and what we've created is a new model for commercialization of this tech that it's required to keep the U.S. ahead of the rest of the world, but also the funding models that make it attractive for private investment to come in to these opportunities. But do we have that right now? I mean, when you look at sort of uh, all the movement we've seen seen in AI as of lately. So much of it seems to be driven by the private sector. And even when the government got involved, who did they turn to first? They said, basically, they brought the private sector in and said, give us a solution to regulating this, which I think caused everyone to kind of scratch their heads. Well, there are two different different questions. Regulation is different than actually the creation Mm -hmm. of the tech. And the creation of the tech, the reason why, go back to the early days of Incutel, the the CEO of the organization, Gilman Lowy, who created Mm Incutel, that was for national security and defense. But it was the same sorts of things that what could you do long term in technology to make the country more secure? And sometimes you need government's involvement because of the risk factors. Mm -hmm. No different than the CHIPS Act as far as you're talking about billions of dollars to create these facilities which are necessary that we control the resilience of the supply chain, but who's going to take the risk of 40 or 50 billion in the private sector? Mm -hmm. I mean, Intel might invest 20 billion, but you're doubling it up now for these kinds of technologies going into the future. So this is why we've come up with this model that says, okay, we're going to collaborate in the science with the the national laboratories and everybody else, and then when you have commercialization, We'll take it to the private sector, but where there's high risk involved, we're going to ask for, we're going to try to seek, which we've done in our first fund. Mm-hmm. There's government involvement, there's private sector involvement as well that combined are going to create the first fund we're about to announce in two or three weeks. Are, are there parallels between what you're trying to do and what we're seeing now and maybe what we saw coming out of the 60s, 70s uh, with some of the uh, Defense Department projects and other some of the science-based projects that were government-based that eventually created the foundations for what really is our tech industry Well, today. you go through a DARPA, yeah. right, is the in there. Yeah. I mean, you go through those initial, I mean, I was, I'm so old, I was involved with 
these things. Yeah. So, I mean, so I can take you through the history of how it was all was done, but fundamentally, it's those kinds of core technologies. That, did you ever think of when you were exchanging technical documents, it would lead to what you do today on your Apple phone, which you just heard about? Mm. You no, know, of course not. Now, this is like, what, 30, 40 years later, but nonetheless, it's the same sort of thing here. But a lot of this stuff does originate, quite honestly, in the science organizations within the government and the academic research organizations. But you still need the private sector to commercialize. Mm. Not just the fund, but also to commercialize, because the talent and the skills that are required to build these companies don't exist in government. In fact, I would never let government do it if I had an opinion on that subject, because that's not what they do. Mm -hmm. So we created these things we call Road Brother Laboratories that actually will take what we're talking about and drive the commercialization phase. So to that point, I've been wondering what the cycle I don't know what to call it, like the cycle of AI or the cycle of AI chips. Like, what, yes. what does that look like? Is it short? Is it long? How does that affect the private, the private money coming in? Well, I'll give you a sense. Historically, that technology cycle, if I take you back 50 years, uh -huh. was 15 to 20 years. Wow. So go back to the mainframe, mainframe to the client-server PC, client-server PC to cloud. They were 15 to 20-year cycles. They started slower. Televisions, phones, all started slower. Today. With generative AI, it is like on steroids relative to the pace of it. However, a lot of people argue that it's at the peak. Even there's research out there that says we're peaking in the cycle. So then what happens next? And you hear it in the enterprise talking about we can't use this stuff. It hallucinates. That's an indication that this thing is peaking. And maybe it's OK for music and poetry or marketing material. But you're not going to go defend the United States uh, infrastructure with that kind of technology, or you're not going to have a bank and not deal with, deal with fraud or cyber with that kind of technology. So my point being is this is where we are, but it's going really, really fast. Now, the, the key, and we believe the key, for it to really be adopted in enterprise, it's basically you have to deal with, we would call them guardrails versus regulations, Roman. Mm -hmm. We would argue that, and we do argue this, that the, the right source for the regulation is not the tech industry itself. Because there are leaders in the tech industry, and they're going to show up with an opinion, which is a valid opinion, right. but also ser it serves the hyperscalers. Yeah. We would say that what you really need to do is who the users of the technology are. So take the businesses, the CEOs of these companies in healthcare, banking, government, whatever it happens to be, and let them come up with, let them innovate on the technology, but, re but regulate the use cases, the application, regulate the use of the data, mm -hmm. regulate the privacy, establish the guardrails so that people are protected and their privacy and their data is protected, both the consumer yeah. as well as the enterprise. Yeah. That should be done by the enterprises. Look, I was in the tech industry for 40 years, right. not by me or my counterparts. All right, Sam, great conversation. I really appreciate you being here today. Sam Palmasano, former CEO over at IBM, and of course, uh, now helping to shepherd that effort of that public-private partnership to further our technological advancement here in the U.S.